afternoon. I'm Mark Michael. I'm the president of the Archaeological Conservancy. Welcome to our video or virtual lecture series. I'm so glad so many of our members are able to join us for this very interesting series of lectures. Our speaker today is Dr. Phil Milhouse. Phil is the Midwest Regional Director of the Archaeological Conservancy. He holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Illinois, and he did his dissertation on the John Chapman site in Northern Illinois. Phil. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for, for attending. Um, what I want to discuss this evening is, is, a, is a topic that had an enormous influence on, on American history, and that, that was the, the Native American mining and smelting of, of lead in the upper Mississippi Valley during the period from the 1600s to, to the late 1820s. Um, I'm going to run through an awful lot of history and, and complicated vying between empires and tribal groups and treaties and, and various other, um, other points going on at the time, but I, I don't want to focus on a lot of that. I want to keep the discussion to kind of the general notion of Native American use of, of lead and the mining and the smelting and the trading and the important role that played in the dynamics of the time and then kind of open it up to questions afterwards. Of course, the area I'm talking about is, is referred to as the Upper Mississippi Valley Lead and, and Zinc District. And it, it is, uh, um, it's an area of, of largely kind of Ordovician era Galena Dolmite in which there are a, a whole series of what are called flattened pitch or crevice lead deposits or Galena. That's the technical word for the mineral. Uh, Galena is PBS, it's a lead sulfide. Um, it's about 86% lead. You you smelt it off the sulfide, and then and then you have have pure lead. And I'll use galena and lead colloquially and interchangeably here throughout throughout the presentation. Um, this mineral obviously was known by by Native American people for thousands and thousands of years, and we have evidence of of galena from the Upper Mississippi Valley um, in burials in in Ontario and as far south as Poverty Point in Louisiana during the late Archaic period. And throughout the rest of the pre-contact period, it was exchanged throughout the mid-continent along with, along with other, other minerals and, and trade goods. It appears to have been used largely to, to create kind of a, a, a whitish gray, white pigment. Uh, we find find pallets from, from grinding of the mineral. It was also deposited as a grave good uh, throughout throughout thousands of years of history. So it, it held some kind of some kind of importance there. Um, and it we don't know the extent of of the mining pre-contact, but I, I think it was probably much more extensive than than we believe. The nature of mining industry is that that the people mine and then all the people who come afterwards and utilize those minerals destroy the previous um, people's basically archaeological record of their working. So, so, so finding sites can, can, and, and dating them can be, be difficult. But Galena was used, used extensively, as I said, and there, there are some, some recent uh, geological work done in Southern Illinois near the Mississippian Kincaid site which shows a local lake, which actually shows levels of pollution from Galena use um, at that time. So there was enough being produced and people were using it in Mississippian communities that it shows up as a signature in, in, in the record of some of these lake sediments. What I wanna focus on this evening is, is jumping ahead in time to, to the period around around the 1600s and moving forward from there. Obviously, as European empires were moving into this, this rugged area of the upper Mississippi Valley, um, they vied for the alliance of different tribal groups and nations, and things were, were very contentious, and they very, very soon became aware of the lead deposits in the region. Uh, the first real European accounts are in the in the 1650s the French discuss that that 
that they noticed Dakota groups in the upper Mississippi Valley mining and, and, and using galena and lead. Um, after that, uh, uh, we, we run across accounts of by the 1690s, uh, the Miami had, had, had temporarily taken refuge in, in this area. It's very rugged um, and, and, and there had been a lot of unrest to the east with the expansion of the Iroquois and, and some of the fur trade wars and some of the Miami groups came into this area and they were mining lead extensively and they went north to the French and asked them to establish posts in their area for the trade of the mineral which Nicholas Perot did in 1690. From his description of where the villages and mines were located in relation to his post, it's most likely they're talking about the Galena or Fever River in Northwest Illinois and Southwest Wisconsin. The, the presence of Europeans obviously then tied like furs and other material, Galena or lead into a whole global economic system where it was used for any number of products, most essential, of course, being being musket balls and, and ammunition at the time. And thus, you know, there was great interest in this. But it wasn't just used for, for musket balls or continued use as pigment. It was used by Native American groups and, and European settlers for any number of things. Uh, this is an example here on this slide. You can see that there are are melted or smelted lead fish hooks, needles, beads, uh, possible Thunderbird effigies and pendants. Here are some examples of hooks and sinkers from the upper Great Lakes that were that were made from from smelted lead. These are are, are more hooks and sinkers as well as lead. Um, bale seals for the, for the fur trade, and also an enormous lead anchor from, from a flatboat from the battle, battle at Prairie de Chine. So you can see that it, it's, a, it's a heavy metal, it's soft, and it was used for virtually every, every kind of tool imaginable, as well as these, these very prominent effigies um, that we assume are turtles. People suggest they could be flying squirrels, they could be uh, several different different animals. And it was also used for the inlaying of, of patlinite pipes. And some of them were extremely elaborate, as you can see here. Here is uh, an, another example of one of these, these turtle effigies. Um, these are, this one is extremely large instead of the size of a quarter. This is about the size of your hand. You can see the engraved nested chevrons there. So, so lead was used, a lot of it was melted down and used for musket balls locally and then traded for that use, but it was also used for any number of domestic and also, also ornamental um, artifacts. This is a picture here. You can see the cubes of Galena. It, it forms in cubes and it has a, a kind of a dark gray cover, color. It's very heavy. When you fracture it, it it's very shiny and, and brilliant. And the deposits that, that we're most interested in for the talk are what are called crevice deposits, which are fractures in the, in the Galena dolomite bedrock near the surface that were mineralized and filled with clay and Galena. And these were accessible to early miners, both Native Americans and later American prospectors. How people located these deposits was, was through looking at the terrain, looking for depressions in hillsides, it would indicate that you, you would have a crevice deposit. Um, another was, was vegetation. Um, this plant on the, on the right is called leadweed um, or Masonic weed. It, it has a very deep root structure. It's a prairie plant. It grows about, the roots can go, get up to 30 feet deep. You can see it has very brilliant purplish flowers in the spring. When it dies off in the, in the fall, it has actually a very lead looking hue and it stands out in the landscape. So people would look at, look for, for these or aspen or birch or other plants that, that would give, give uh, clues to where lead deposits were. Um, American prospectors later on discuss using all of these methods and they obviously learn them from talking with native peoples in the area. So how was, how was the lead mined at the time? 
from accounts by military officers and, and traders and, and, and other people, um, Native American groups, the Meskwaki and the Ho-Chunk especially, uh, used tools that they acquired through the fur trade, um, hoes and, and mattocks and, and shovels, flattened gun barrels, but also antlers from, from deer, as well as uh, birch bark buckets and rawhide ropes. And they would mine the mineral they, in a different way than Americans. Americans sunk shafts to hit crevices and then tunneled out. Native Americans would dig down to the crevice and then follow it linearly and, and create a large trench into a hillside and pull the material out. And then it would be smelted in, in these furnaces. Um, and, and the accounts discuss that, that there would be trenches dug into hillsides. They would be lined with stone. The mineral would be put in there with a charge, which was usually wood and brush. It would be fired and the sulfur again would burn off. The molten lead would come down into a basin and be into a bar or a, that was usually referred to as a pig. And the, the general weight was about 70 pounds um, for one of these pigs of lead. And then that could later be used and melted down for musket balls, ornaments, buttons, any number of things that people wanted to use it for. One of the interesting things about especially the Meskwaki accounts, is that a lot of people describe that this, this uh, the lead or the mineral was primarily mined by, by women. In, in Western culture, we associate mining most often as, as a fairly macho male dominated industry. These early accounts of the Meskwaki talk about a lot of this, this mining being done, being done by women. Um, and so I'm I'm not sure if this was like some of the sugar bushes and and other resources where where matrilines and 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 women had control of, of a resource or how it was used and and the proceeds dispersed from that. Um, and others say we should take these accounts with a with a grain of salt. We have we have limited accounts. We have it's largely from the Meskwaki where this is mentioned. Um, accounts of Ho-Chunk mining do not mention the prevalence of women in the industry as much. Um, so, so we're not really sure how that, how that broke down, but at least in several people like Sco Henry Schoolcraft and other talk about much of the mining work actually being, being dominated by, by women, sorting, sorting out these accounts from the realities of how this worked in, in Native American society, we, we don't know. Many of the later um, American accounts of, of mining that kind of established mining history in the upper Mississippi Valley, which was one of the first uh, major mineral booms in the United States. It was also the longest running continuously. Uh, um, let me go back here. Continuously operating mining district in the United States, about 157 years from 1822 when the first at least Anglo-American miners were there to 1979. But the when 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 the history is compiled about that mining district, many times it talks about Native Americans as using the mineral before and kind of just scratching the surface and 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 getting placer stream specimens or or surface you know patch deposits and and not really involved in extensive mining. But nothing could be further from the truth. When you actually go back to the early accounts as well as the uh, trade ledgers, um, you see that this was an enormous part of, of the economy for Native groups, especially the Meskwaki and the Ho-Chunk. And, and it, it provided an en enormous source of income when fur-bearing animals were largely being depleted from the upper Mississippi Valley. And this wasn't just something opportunistic or scratching the surface. It was, it was industrial production on a massive scale. Um, traders talk about coming to the Galena River in various areas and buying 140,000 pounds of lead bars from the Squawky and leaving much more on the bank. This was a, this was, a, this was a large scale industry. As an example of this, I want to show you a couple images from a site north of my hometown of Galena, Illinois in Northwestern Illinois. 
This is the Buck Mine, which was a very, very famous lead mine. It was probably mined by, by the Miami, maybe the Dakota earlier, the Meskwaki uh, mine there for, for many years. You can see this a picture of my father standing in this trench, which is several hundred feet long and, and over 20 feet deep. That, that's an extensive mine. You can see a map here that shows the open cut of the, uh, of the buck mine and then all the other prospecting pits that came later on from American miners. This is a LIDAR image of that same hillside. You can see the long trench of the Meskwaki mine, and you can see the hillside peppered with depressions, which are the later um, American, American prospects. These are additional pictures that show you the extent, how large this mine was. Um, the picture on the lower right, if you visit the Buck mine, it still has Galena in the walls. I want to just talk about several of the areas where there was a real focus of, of Native American mining. And, 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 and the first one is, is an area referred to as the Mines of Spain um, near, near present day Dubuque, Iowa. Uh, this, this was an area where a French Canadian by the name of, of Julian Dubuque worked out a lease agreement with the local Meskwaki to mine and smelt lead around Dubuque and across the river in southwest Iowa and, and in northwestern Illinois. Here's on this lower picture on the lower right, you can see an example of, of a trench mine, a Meskwaki trench mine, in amongst a bunch of later American prospects around Catfish Creek. What Dubuque did was he worked with the Meskwaki and with his, his French Canadian employers and he sort of monopolized the, the lead trade in the upper Mississippi Valley for several, several decades. Um, he eventually decided to branch out into the fur trade and he borrowed a significant amount of money to uh, outfit Meskwaki uh, fur trade parties to the West. Unfortunately, they ran into Dakota groups who put an end to that and Dubuque ended up losing substantial amount of investment. So what he did was he traveled south to St. Louis and he sold the bottom half of his lease, which is shown on this, this old map here, um, to the Chateau family who are a very influential wealthy fur trade family who will come up again when we, when we talk about um, uh, the Gratiots later on. When Dubuque returned, um, this was in 1804, he continued to work in the area. He died in 1810. The Meskwaki buried him um, amongst one of their own cemeteries and a burial mound group that overlooks their village, which is now south of Dubuque, Dubuque, Iowa. Immediately after Dubuque's death, a swarm of creditors came up the Mississippi River to lay claim um, to, to his lands. And the Meskwaki were not happy to say the least to find out that this individual that they had considered a friend who they had given this lease to had actually sold land, which was not his to sell, um, to the Chateau family. So the Meskwaki had enough of that. So they burned Dubuque's buildings. They drove off all the rival groups from St. Louis, some of them quite shady outfits, and kind of set up a new policy in the lead district that we will trade with any Americans at the mouths of rivers and we'll trade all the lead that they can purchase. But if you try to see the mines, um, we will kill you. And they, they held to that policy very strictly. So what ended up happening is then you get a whole series of accounts by Henry Shreve of Shreveport, Louisiana, um, namesake, uh, John Shaw, all these um, flatboat captains who, who come up the Mississippi River and, and, and trade at the mouth of the river with the Meskwaki. And they're the ones that begin to give accounts of, of the incredible amount of, of lead that was being, being exchanged there. Um, a, good, a, a good account of how, how impressive this trade was, was that in, in 1811, there were, there were two uh, two discharged American soldiers, um, Nathan Pryor and George Hunt, who, who 
bargained with the Meskwaki and, and they allowed them to establish a smelter and a trading post on the southern edge of uh, uh, Dubuque's claim. Um, and, and that post was set up in, in the fall of 1811. Um, as things were heating up with Britain, it was obvious there was going to be another conflict with Great Britain. Um, and they set this operation up in the fall and, and they talk about in their records of receiving 10 to 15 canoes full of lead from the Squawky a day. And by New Year's, they had purchased over 500,000 pounds of lead, smelted it, and they, it, the exchange was so lucrative that they, the Fort Madison factory or the government run trading factory that they were affiliated with in Southeast Iowa was the only American factory to actually operate in the black that year. And it was solely because of the lead trade. And the Meskwaki were very skilled um, at, at playing off various trading companies and kind of rival groups of traders for, for the best advantage in doing this. So some of this lead went up to Prairie du Chien or into the the, the British sympathetic trade networks to the north as well. Um, the the trading posts at Tede Mar did not last long. Um, um, there were there were groups of Ho Chunk who had participated in in um, Tippecanoe in the battle at Prophetstown, and to to settle scores with the Americans, uh, two um, two leaders, Rolling Thunder and Maneater from Lake Koshkanong raised a war party of 100 individuals. And on New Year's Day in 1812, they burned the Tede Mar uh, smelter and trading post to the ground. And some of this was related to avenging losses um, incurred by the Americans at, at Tippecanoe, but some of it was because there's a lot, fair amount of documentation that although George Hunt and Nathan Pryor were on a trading venture, they were also active acting as intelligence agents for the US military out of St. Louis, trying to figure out how various local Native American nations were going, going to go if war broke out with Britain and especially with the alliance with Tecumseh. So that was the end of the Tete Moore um, trading post. But the Americans continued throughout the war um, to to trade in the area, there was a lot of dissension among among Native American bands over who to who to support. Um, and after the war, um, the American government made it clear that they would use use military force to allow traders closer access to the mines. And at this point, the Meskwaki allowed a whole series of traders: uh, Amos Farrar, Jesse Shull and a number of others to establish trading posts around Galena, Illinois. And that became known as, as the Trader's Village. Um, this kind of operated for several years until 1822, there was a Kentucky Colonel by the name of James Johnson, who, uh, who took out the first lead lease from the American government to actually allow Americans to, to mine lead. Um, the, the Americans were very interested now in, in, in gaining control of this area because it became clear with the war with Britain that not having a good source of munitions and the raw material needed it was a huge disadvantage. So the lead lands were not divided up and open for sale or settlement the way farmlands were elsewhere. It was for quite a while under the control of the War Department as kind of a strategic resource. Uh, Johnson took out the first lease. Um, he came north with a group of workmen that included enslaved African-Americans as well as uh, free African-Americans. And he met the Meskwaki at the Trader's Village in Galena. And there was a three-day very tense standoff with the Meskwaki, with Johnson, with a number of the traders, and with a large contingent, of course, of, of, of military troops who came down. Because the Meskwaki had allowed the traders to set up, they did not want to sell the mines to people like Johnson. Eventually, they acquiesced. They allowed him to purchase the Buck Mine, the Hog Lead, the Cave Leads, and a series of other mines on the Galena River Valley. For a while, for several years, there was sort of an uneasy truce as Meskwaki and, and, 
and Americans and, and African Americans were mining lead in, in the Galena River Valley. There were a number of, of Meskwaki bands in the area also supplying game to some of the early mining settlements and, and prospecting groups that came up. But as the wealth and the richness of the mines filtered back to St. Louis and other places, it started off the, the first major lead rush. And after 1824, 25, 26, you see the numbers of, of American prospectors pouring out of the Upper South, Kentucky, Tennessee, Southern Missouri, increasing immensely. And that's when, when things became tense and violent in the Galena River Valley. There's accounts of, of miners stomping a Menominee woman to death in the streets of Galena in 1827. It was obvious it was becoming a very inhospitable place. So most of Meskwaki removed across the river to Dubuque's mines along Catfish, along Catfish Creek and the Maco Little Maquoketa River. Um, and the, the Galena River was pretty much taken over by swarms of prospectors. If you look on this map, you can, you can see this map was made in 1829 by a cartographer named Chandler. It is full of fascinating information. Um, some, some things are incorrect and, and not to scale or information is off, but it, it's, it's a really interesting document. If you look at it, you can see what's called the Fox or the Meskwaki Village over at Dubuque's Mines across the Mississippi. You can also see that the Galena River here over on the left side is just full of smelters and settlements and mine diggings that are, that are controlled by the Americans. And the, this line across that runs across here uh, represents what was supposed to be the dividing line between, between the Galena River Valley and the American mines, and then Ho-Chunk mines to the east in Ho-Chunk territory. And I wanna kind of shift discussion to, to, to the Ho-Chunk workings, which aren't given as much attention in the literature of the historical accounts. In 1825, there was a treaty in Prairie du Chien that, that stated that rivers that flow into the Mississippi were fair game for American miners the rivers that flowed into the rock, that would be considered Ho-Chunk territory, and, and those, those would be left alone by American miners. Now you can see a series of circles here that represent Ho-Chunk villages in the rock and Sugar River Valleys, Pecatonica River, and some of the other tributaries. If you observe astutely, you will also see that across that line are a whole series of American settlements and smelters and mines. And, and this had to do with the fact that um, once, when, when, when somebody took out a smelting license, you, you had to pay 10% of that smelted lead to the government. The government originally tried taxing individual prospectors. That was just untenable because there were tens of thousands of them. So they started taxing the smelters 10%. Well, what the smelters realized is if they quickly crossed into Ho-Chunk territory, um, then they could claim we don't have to pay any taxes because we're not on American territory, we're on Ho-Chunk territory. Well, Ho-Chunk of course made many missions to Galena to complain about this, about violent abuse from the miners, about armed camps of miners with palisades and about smelters setting up shop and then attracting settlers. Um, the Indian uh, the, or the, the lead agents, the mining agents in Galena ignored all these entreaties and some of them are quite open in their letters to Washington that they, they plan to ignore um, the Ho-Chunk complaints because eventually the violence would break out and it would give the government pretext to seize the land. So it was, it was ignored on purpose and, and these frictions continued over time. I want to just I want to I want to bring out kind of a different strategy that that the the Ho Chunk appeared to have attempted in trying to deal with the fact that there were intrusions onto their territory coming out of the Galena River Valley and many of these prospectors and early miners were coming out of the Upper South there was no love for Native Americans or or their culture and things things were becoming very violent and very tense. Um, there, there was an enormous amount of, of lead discovered around the present town of Shulzburg, Wisconsin. 
uh, several Americans, including Jesse Schull, who gave the town his name, attempted to work out um, agreements with the Ho-Chunk to mine this lead. Um, things did not go well. Um, they probably did not follow the stipulations they were given, and the Ho-Chunk drove them off. There was a family of, of smelters, two brothers, uh, Henry Grashit and his brother, who had, who had moved to Gleena in 1825, 26, and established a smelting establishment and also had a number of contacts with Native American groups. The Grashits, their mother was a Chateau, who if you remember, that was a powerful family from St. Louis with a lot of fur trade connections, connections with Native Americans and Creole communities throughout the Missouri River and the upper Mississippi Valley. And the Ho-Chunk often referred to Grashit as Chateau. They were referred to him as, by his mother's name, acknowledging the connection with, with that family. The, the, the Grashits approached the Ho-Chunk and, and were given permission to establish a settlement at what became known as Grashits Grove. You can see it here on the original General Land Office map. This came to be include a whole series of, of smelters, at times fortifications, trading warehouses, and settlements that included French workmen, American miners, um, Swiss colonists who came back from the Red River, um, as well as a number of, of, of Ho-Chunk villages over time. And it appears that by inviting the Grashits to that area, it was, it was a, a way to try to, um, to have a powerful family there who could help negotiate between these Anglo intruders and, and trying to protect their own territory and villages and mining operations to the east. Um, Grashit eventually was made a sub-agent to the Ho-Chunk um, and, and worked on their behalf during, during the, the turmoil of the Black Hawk War. Later on, um, he tried to get annuities paid to the Ho-Chunk that were owed by treaty. Um, that were not being paid, and I believe he died in, 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 on a trip to Washington in 1836 while trying to, trying to get some of those affairs settled. But there are accounts in local newspapers um, of Ho-Chunk families coming back to the Schulzburg area to visit extended family uh, related to Grashitz as late as the, the 1890s. So those connections were strong. This is one of the later um, Grashit homes um, on the Grove, um, the actual early cabin site and, and site associated with the, with the uh, early lead rush is, is kind of across the road and up the hill. Um, and and these, are, these are examples of those lead, be they squirrels, be they turtles, but they're, they're, they're effigies, um, smelted effigies that have been found at Grashit's Grove along with a number of other Ho-Chunk and Native American sites throughout the mid-continent. Uh, this, uh, this image shows uh, Dr. Uh, Guido Pesarosi and, and local historian Corey Ritterbush. They're doing some remote sensing. Um, Guido has works and teaches at Syracuse University and has for several years um, run a field school at Gracious Grove to attempt to locate where the original cabins and trading warehouses and fortifications and smelting furnaces were located in a part of this sort of, I call it an incipient Creole community, a sort of mixed community that, that, that existed there for several years. I wanna go back to Chandler's map again. Um, if you look back, you can see Grashis Grove there sitting on, on the western edge of that area. Much of the Ho-Chunk mining activity was focused on what became known as, as the Sugar River diggings. Um, you can see that circled in red here. Um, there are several villages showing as well as, as well as digging areas. And these were pretty extensive workings as well. Um, there was a trader, Esau Johnson, who talks about, you know, there being 20 or 30 smelters in blast or operating in this area and that there was a large amount of, of lead available for exchange. Um, there were several traders who set up in that area, married Ho-Chunk women. And, and again, as with Grashit's Grove, there was sort of an incipient kind of Creole community developing here. Both of those communities would 
disperse and dissolve after the tragedies of the, of the Black Hawk War and the resulting treaties, which punished the Meskwaki and the Sauk and the Ho-Chunk and, and, and the land sessions and the, the forced, forced removals that followed. Um, a lot of the, there hasn't been a lot of, again, attention to, to the Ho-Chunk mining in the, in, the, in the region, but it was very extensive. Um, if you if you look at this yellow circle over here, that's roughly the area of Lake Koshkanong and the Four Lakes, where there were a number of Ho Chunk villages in the 1820s and 30s. But local collections from that that area show an incredible amount of lead, um, not just being used for musket balls or or ornamental effigies, but for all kinds of tools and utilitarian objects. This image shows raw galena, smelted lead, even a, a pipe made out of, out of lead. This is another example of some of those, I refer to them as turtle effigies. We are not exactly sure what, what, they, what they may represent, but they appear to be important because they show up at a number of these sites. If, if you look at look at collections and you look at early accounts of, of the areas occupied by, by Ho-Chunk villages along the Hara and Lake Kashkanong, four lakes around Madison, people always talk about the immense amount of like raw galena that's, that's present, the, the raw unsmelted cubes. And if any of you've picked up galena, you've certainly picked up lead, it, it's heavy. And so it would make most sense to smelt it at the source and take those bars or pegs back to your encampment and, and then melt those down um, and use them for what, for what you needed. Hauling a raw, around raw lead across the landscape would be, would be really burdensome. Um, and, and the Sugar River diggings are far enough removed from this area that it, it would have been a bit, a bit of a trek. So recently I've started looking at other accounts, early accounts of, of mines that and mining areas of American activity on the very far eastern edge of the lead district. And there are some other mining areas in, in um, the Black Earth area and, and different locales, which if you, if from the records I've been able to trace back are referred to as, as old Indian diggings or probably old Indian digging. So these probably represent other Ho-Chunk mines that were even closer to the concentration of, of settlements and communities around the Yahara and the Lake Koshkanong and Four, Four Lakes area. As I mentioned, after, after the Black Hawk War um, um, and, and the, the forced removals that accompanied the treaties that followed that, that, that largely ended um, the, the Native American mining tradition in the upper Mississippi Valley and the area was taken over by, by swarms of, of American miners who then started an, a new tradition of, of mining. What, what's unique about this is that so much of our scholarship focuses on the fur trade and the impact of the fur trade and what was going on with that economy and, and how Native Americans reacted and adapted and, and the role that played in their cultural developments and, and with with oncoming American settlement. And the, the lead mining and this kind of industrial mining and smelting and the role that played is, is largely left out of that picture. And it was really very, very, very critical. Another thing that's interesting about this era is, as I said, in most areas when you have mining, um, you the later mining, which is much more extensive and industrial, wipes out any previous um, records of what earlier people did. This happens all over the world. That's why mining archeology span is difficult. It by nature destroys what came before. But we actually have some examples in the upper Mississippi Valley of extant intact, you know, Meskwaki, Ho-Chunk mines in amongst um, later American prospects. They're, they're still there that, that we can look at and, and hopefully preserve. So as I said, I've, I've run through a lot of history. I've glossed over a lot of complications and events and tried to present a very general picture of what happened at this time and what was going on on a little known aspect of, of Native American history, which had a huge impact on 
on the developing American nation. And I'll just stop there and, and open it up for questions, if that's all right. That's great, Phil. Um, we have sent you a few questions in your chat. Okay. I am going to try to relocate chat. Okay. Um, you probably have a lot of, of messages, so you can just kind of <laughs> read through them from the top and work your way down and we'll get to as many as we can. Okay, I'm seeing my thing, okay. Um, all right, you might have to guide me through relocating the chat here. Okay, you know what? That probably be best if you stop sharing your presentation because that way you'll have access to everything kind of full screen if that's okay with you. Okay. So if you move to the move your arrow to the top, there's a menu up there and you can just hit stop sharing. Okay. Under slideshow. Um, actually, if you just move your arrow to the very top of the screen, a little WebEx menu will appear. And okay. it'll kind of like kind of appear at the top of your screen and then you can hit stop sharing from there. Okay, yeah, I'm in the PowerPoint and. Let's see here. I can probably stop sharing for you. Let me see if I can do it. There we go. Okay. Okay. All right. There, I see the chats. All right. Great. Great. All right. I'll just, should I just start out here from the top? Sure. And we can work our way through. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Okay. So you can kind of, and I'll give you a cue when we get closer to the end. Okay. I see that. I see one here. Is there any evidence of lead heavy metal poisoning among these groups? Um, not directly from this time period. My, my guess is that probably among American miners and earlier Meskwaki Ho-Chunk miners, if you're mining and smelting and burning off this much lead, it would have had very unpleasant health, I won't say health benefits, <laughs> detrimental uh, health impacts. There was, there was a study done before, uh, before NAGPRA and, and, and more concern and respect for Native American graves and, and, and burials. There was a study done a while ago uh, dealing with uh, skeletal material from from a Western group post contact where where there was a lot of accounts of of children were responsible for melting down the lead and making the musket balls. That's that was one of their one of their ta domestic tasks. And in looking at some of the skeletal material, the lead levels um, were through the roof, um, were unbelievable. And so again, that was done a while ago before we were, you know, a little more respectful of, of, of burials and, and people's wishes regarding that. But just from that study, if you extrapolate that out, um, I'm, I'm guessing here, but if you're, if you're digging and excavating and smelting and then burning all this sulfide and lead off, um, that would have had some, some negative health benefits and it would have for probably later American miners as well. Um, when you when you look at the early pictures of American smelters and you look at the landscape in the background, it looks like a wasteland. It's a denuded wasteland. Of course, a lot of the trees and material was cut for to fuel the smelters, but with all that sulfur and other trace minerals burning off and falling out all over the landscape, it was not good. And if plants weren't surviving, people were probably being negatively affected. Uh, some someone asked here a question from Facebook. Um, are these objects jewelry? Uh, some of the ones that I showed, the the pierced, uh, what looked like pierced buttons, certainly are 
our jewelry. There was a piece I saw from a collection near Galena, Illinois, near my hometown, which was a, a metal, a probably a silver metal that had been acquired in, in, in the fur trade, and then it had been filled with molten lead, possibly to, to, to make it heavier or to hang easier. Uh, that large turtle that I showed, the very big one that's the size of your hand, that is actually pierced for, for wearing. I assume probably only at certain times because that would be one heck of a thing to wear around all the time. Um, that would be pretty heavy. But yes, there was any number of um, um, molten lead artifacts that looked like they were probably ornamental. Another question um, from Facebook, what about writing material and drawing material? Um, I don't know, you know, I would not be surprised if, you know, if there was availability of slate and et cetera through, through trade networks, if, if lead could have been used to mark much as it was by, by settlers and, and, and Americans later on. There are fragments of slate uh, found at like the Gratiot's Grove site. So obviously this was available probably for children there, but I presume it could be exchanged to Native Americans as well, and it could be used. Again, I'm, I'm just speculating on, on that. Um, another, did Native Americans not use the concept of land ownership, but rather of territory by, by the group? Well, I don't even want to touch that one. That's really complicated. I, I, I would, I guess in, in most general, in my opinion, from my, my standpoint, I look at it as like this kind of idea that, that Westerners have of we own this tract of land and, and, and all rights that go with it and it's just ours or our families or whatever. That kind of, of concept seems to have been, been quite alien. It was much more of kind of a group or a band had access to, to the group of resources in this area to use and be exploited and to be shared for the benefit of the group. And, and, and that difference was, was at the, you know, the critical edge of, of so many conflicts where Native Americans out of good faith offered land and resources as they did with Julian Dubuque on sort of a lease basis. There's enough for everyone, you can use this. Well, Westerners didn't see it that way. They, they pushed the envelope and, and, and then made a claim that this is ownership just for me and not you who originally had it or anyone else. And so, so there are very different concepts of, of how land and resources were, were shared that, that created lots of conflicts largely because um, as I said, many times things were offered out of, out of good faith and, 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 and settlers took that to mean something totally, totally different. Um, did the locals, uh, uh, both indigenous and later Europeans, connect lead and zinc to any diseases? Also, how far did the lead and zinc artifacts travel from the area under consideration? We kind of touched on the on the health health issues. Um, again, like I said, even pre-contact, there's evidence of, at the Mississippian site of Kincaid that there was enough galena being used. That was probably mostly coming from southeast Missouri deposits. That it actually shows up as a as a pollutant in the lake level. Um, but nothing to the extent of what you saw post contact with with the massive smelting that was fueling into kind of this global economy and and trade goods. Um, but how far did the lead go? My guess is lead from the upper Mississippi Valley was probably being traded throughout the entire mid continent because it was it was so critical, especially for for musket balls and other things. Uh, pre contact again, I mentioned as far back as the late archaic, there were there were, there's Galena from the upper Mississippi Valley showing up in Poverty Point, showing up in, in, uh, in Ontario. When you look at the, the middle woodland period, um, you see a, from work that, that Dr. John Walthall did in the early 1980s, you see that many middle woodland sites in Illinois, the trace elements do not show as prominent a lead signature coming from the upper Mississippi Valley but sites in Ohio do. So, so there were, it wasn't just proximity, this thing was moving through already culturally assigned trade networks uh, across the area.
Uh, question, do you still see mold impressions in the quarry sites? I think it would be amazing to find one sometime. Not that I, I don't know of any that have been found. Uh, there have been a number of smaller scale smelting um, um, furnaces located um, at Lake Koshkanong Ho-Chunk Villages uh, by Janet Spector in the, in the, in the 1970s. Um, I am guessing there are probably smelting sites in the upper Mississippi Valley where you could still relocate the trench furnaces and, and some of the, the molds where the lead flowed. Uh, the issue is, of course, like the mines, when Americans poured over the area, they looked for signs of the old smelters too and excavated them for, for, for scrap metal that could be re-smelted. But I'm sure some of them do survive. We just, we haven't found them yet. Another question about kind of the heavy metal poisoning, which I think I, I'm pretty sure probably did happen. Um, did mining a lead zinc lead, uh, did it lead to iron mining and making iron? If so, is there trade in iron, iron implements or artifacts? I think there was a lot of resmelting and repurposing of brass and iron trade goods into, into other tools and, and, and things, but, but the lead seems to have stayed very specifically to, to using the lead for, for lead material and, and lead artifacts. Okay, here's a question on what was more on the prospecting methods, um, the relationship between uh, the mining district of uh, Eastern Missouri. Um, I kind of mentioned the prospecting methods um, early on in looking at landscape, um, um, terrain signs, depressions, looking at vegetation, and, and from accounts of, of early American prospectors, the, you know, these were things that Native Americans had used to identify lead deposits previously. Another of the most you know, obvious ways that American prospectors looked for good places to, to find lead was exactly what was used in the upper peninsula of Michigan with copper, is they looked for evidence of previous Native American mining. And that was a pretty good pretty good clue that you obviously were probably on a series of rich crevice deposits that you could then you could then exploit. So there was a lot of looking for older Native American mines or trying to trying to pay off Native Americans with trade goods, et cetera, to identify some of these these mining areas. Um, the relationship with Southeast Missouri historically is is pretty strong. A lot of the first miners coming up and prominent men like Henry Dodge, the Grashits, others are coming out of St. Louis, coming out of involvement in the Southeast um, Missouri Mining District, which was operating very early. So a number of those people initially came up to the, to the lead district and were very influential in, in what happened there. There's some more questions on, on the lead, lead poisoning, um, which was an issue. Let me go up one here. I see something specific to... There's a question about the, the artifacts from, from Lake Koshkanong. Those were in, in private collections from people who had surface collected and metal detected over that area for, for a number of years. Um, and as far as archaeology, though, dealing with, with this, as I, I mentioned before, Janet Spector had done some work at a site called Crabapple Point in the 1970s, and she excavated a series of lead artifacts in, in areas where it looks like people were doing small scale in camp smelting to make musket balls and other artifacts. Um, is there lead present in the local water? Yes, <laughs> um, there is, and that's why now. When you, when you do wells in that area, oftentimes they will try to put the wells down into the St. Peter sandstone, which is, uh, operates as a filter and lies below the lead deposits. And if you casing that, hoping that then you're out of, 
out of the wells, but it, it's good to get get your water tested because it's there and some of the later mining sites are now Superfund sites and they have definitely led to some massive pollution on the landscape. Do the extant um, Ho-Chunk, Meskwaki mines have surface features such as pig molds, et cetera? The, the mining features are still there. The, trend, the trench mines are very visible. As I mentioned earlier, I'm sure there are, are trench smelter sites there. We just haven't, haven't found them yet. They were probably, probably buried under talus or later erosion or some of them, many of them were excavated. Was the lead worked at Kincaid from Saint Fran in, in Southeast Missouri? I believe so. I believe most of that lead showing up in that lake level deposit from the Mississippi site of Kincaid was coming from, from Southeast Missouri. Is there any way to document compositional analysis on the smelted lead to identify the different sources? There is, and I mentioned Dr. John Walfall previously, he had done some of this sourcing in the, in the early 1980s, trying to identify where lead artifacts from various sites in the Midwest were originating through time, through different time periods. And it was published in, in, in a book by the Illinois State Museum, which I don't think it's still in print, but I'm sure you could you could find it um, online or at an archaeological conference somewhere. And what's interesting about that is, as I said, it shows that Galena was moving through kind of cultural designated trade networks. It wasn't just, well, just because you're close to the upper Mississippi Valley, that's where all the lead is. Sometimes from these sites that are out of that area, sometimes that's true, but sometimes it seems to hop and skip. So obviously these things are moving again through cultural trade routes, not just by geographic proximity. Um, they mention uh, uh, Fort Watnon, which part of that site, as you know, is an archeological conservancy preserve, um, which just received a uh, national historic landmark status. Um, and there are a number of lead artifacts at that site as well. My guess is that those artifacts were probably coming from the upper Mississippi Valley. I haven't done compositional analysis on them, obviously, but given the fact that the Miami were in Northwestern Illinois for a period and mining lead extensively before coming back into Indiana, I would guess they would be obviously well aware of those deposits and would have maintained contact with that area. Hey, Phil? Yes. We are getting very close to, to being finished here. You can take another okay. question or two if you'd like. You had a lot of questions, so perhaps we can send you the list and okay. you can answer some of them and we can post them on the website later on. All right, that's fine. That's fine. Great. Thank you everyone and feel free to contact me if you have further questions and I'll do my best to answer them or direct you to somebody who can. <laughs> Great, thank you guys for attending tonight. Thank you.